Uh, up next is Bill Hartzell. Uh, he's Director of Strategic Execution and Advanced Delivery Technologies, Technologies at Catalan Pharma. Uh, Bill's presentation, Reducing the Risk Associated with the Filling of Biologics with Advanced Aseptic Processing. Bill, thank you very much. All right, excellent. Well, again, Brian, thank you for the uh, introduction. And, and one of the things that I'll, I'll talk to today is really looking at how do you leverage the advanced aseptic processing of Blowfield Seal and how that actually is utilized to reduce the risks associated with the filling process of biologics. So ultimately, I'll get into a case study and where and how we actually filled a monoclonal antibody uh, within this technology to really look at uh, a comparability between the uh, plastic advocep vial versus uh, a traditional glass vial. Uh, to start this out, one of the real keys and, and some of the reasons why the advanced aseptic processing of Blowfield Seal is getting a lot of attention, not only within the industry, but also with the agency, is, is really trying to, to go after the root cause of a lot of the manufacturing challenges that exist today in traditional glass filling. So your areas where you see um, you know, multiple, mul uh, multiple market actions and things like you know, drug recalls is really driven, you know, a strong part around microbial contamination, particulate contamination, both glass and foreign particulate. And this technology itself, by leveraging and utilizing an automatic aseptic manufacturing process, we're able to eliminate a lot of those issues that arise. So we're able to eliminate you know, delamination, we're able to eliminate uh, glass particulates, we're the, the, the elimination of really human intervention during your critical fill processing really is what is also allowing us to drive out a lot of those risks you know, associated with aseptic manufacturing. Additionally, we're able to provide you know, a plastic container, which we leveraged polypropylene in this instance, which has very good uh, chemical compatibility as well as um, you know, a, a more inert surface for interaction with biologics. So you know, again, we've got some of these root causes of why and how the technology is really driving to provide a, a, a lower risk approach to aseptic filling uh, of materials. At the root of what we do uh, is the blowfield seal process and in, in where we convert, really we're taking pellets of resin we run that through an extruder, and that's actually converted to form the, the body of a container. And then we fill, uh, we fill that product, and then we're able to uh, either insert a stopper or, you know, really whatever type of thing that you'd want inserted. We automatically insert that into the container, and then we seal. So all of that takes place within the confines of the machine, and all of that takes place in a matter of 15 seconds. So we can produce anywhere between 50 and, uh, you know, anywhere between 8 and 50 units in a 15 second cycle, all depending upon how much or, or what's the uh, design of that container. You know, so it took me longer, even within this conversation, it took me a longer period of time to explain the technology than it is to actually run it. And I think the best part is that you are completely contained within the machine itself. And that's what provides a lot of your uh, aseptic assurance uh, for the product. But then also think about the container and how long it's open for. Uh, and that really is what reduces your risk of actually getting particles in uh, inside the container itself. So just looking at it schematically as well. So when you look at all of the variables that are out there of, of handling glass, uh, at the end of the day, what we, we truly start to eliminate is all of the glass and component uh, management. So all of those materials, you're basically able to, you know, you, you don't wash a container, you don't depyrogenate it, you don't have to go through a lot of those handling issues and requirements because we actually form and fill that product all inside that Class A environment. And that, that just takes a whole level of complexity out of what the process really is. And then you look at it from a footprint standpoint, about your controlled space within that. So instead of having uh, you know, a Class A environment throughout to be able to handle those vials all the way through, the, the, the 
footprint, the actual control is maintained within that machine. So you're talking about orders of magnitude reduction in controlled space in these two different environments. So, and that's really why the advanced aseptic processing of BFS really does drive out the risks associated. You know, the, the principles and the foundations of QBD are really built into the automated uh, aseptic filling of this process. And, and this is where we're able to minimize those variables. And a lot of what we've done over the years is really spent millions of dollars microbially challenging that equipment and those the, the machinery itself. So we understand where and what our critical control parameters are within that process to ensure that we provide an aseptic process or an aseptic product every time. And those are the things that we're able to do to drive that risk down. But ultimately, what we're also doing in this process is you are creating a container closure. And that's the other thing. So it creates an opportunity, and then there's also things that you have to address because you are moving away from glass. So a lot of what we've done, you know, foundationally is really focused on what's the container closure look like, providing the data and the information behind the container closure itself to then couple that with a better process and an improved process to provide a better product into the market. And that's where we've, we've spent a lot of effort. And really it's things like looking at the leachable and extractables profiles, making sure that you understand from a uh, permeation uh, look, so from a stability. And that's one of the really good things of, of glass is that it is impervious. And so it's a matter of us being able to look at it, to see it, to understand what's actually taking place. And that's a lot of the work that we've done uh, really to evaluate not just, the, um, not just the process itself, but really the container closure. And that's what we'll spend the rest of the time really looking at the biologic within that process to make sure that we understand how's that container closure performing uh, within the, um, you know, in relationship to glass. You know, so again, some of the foundational stuff that you have to do when you, when you look at that container closure is really the, the two things that's at the utmost important. Is the product safe and does the product work, right? So the safety and efficacy of what we're doing and, and what we look at, you know, again, what's leaching out? Are we able to maintain sterility over time? Also the efficacy of the product. So these are the, the, the main thinkings of what we had when we, we designed the design of experiment for the biologic. Um, you know, again, I, I think biologics also pose a, another, uh, you know, challenge as well. So it's, we utilize heat to form that container. So we've got to be able to understand what's the thermal stability of that molecule as it goes through. How fast can we dissipate that heat? How does that happen? You know, and that's one of the things of operating from a solution into it, you know, looking at, you know, simple solutions versus a biologic. We've got to understand that thermal stability and that look. So we've done a lot of work there. You know, also from a gas permeation standpoint, what's that, how's that product going to perform over time, either with a moisture loss or, you know, with oxygen ingress or egress uh, into the product. You know, and so ultimately, and then what, what does that uh, extraction profile or the leachable profile really, uh, does that affect the molecule itself? So those are the considerations we had within, you know, the biologic space. So again, there's been a lot of really good work. So from our standpoint, we've looked at it, and even though you have 180 degrees C of temperature coming out in that parison, that temperature dissipates very, very quickly. And so from that, we know that in a matter of about, a second or two seconds within contact within the mold itself, you actually get very good heat transfer and heat loss out of that. So you get that down to your, your temperatures. And, and really, there's been a lot of really good work done by uh, the equipment manufacturers of looking at this and analyzing this. We've shown a peak temperature of what you get from the material coming through at, at around 40 degrees C. Uh, it's a very, very dynamic space within that container because you have cold material coming in and filling while you have that higher temperature. So there's a lot of things that impact it from wall thickness, from container design, from fill volume ratios, you know, but ultimately it's dynamic. So you got a continuous cool. We saw a peak temperature around 40 degrees C. Um, you know, ultimately you, you, there, there's other data that supports that you can actually get a lot lower of what's going on inside there. And that, that information is also out there. Again, from a permeation standpoint, and again, it's specific to the molecule. You know, we'll go into it specific to the molecule and how that looks. But one of the things that we did to make sure, and especially when talking about biologics, 
looking at the different temperatures that are out there um, and permeation rates, temperature is a huge, huge factor. So if you look at what, what it looks like, if you have something that's stored in cold conditions, you know, so 2 to 8 degrees C, which most, you know, biologics are stored at, you know, ultimately that permeation rate is drastically different than room temperature or even accelerated, you know, uh, conditions. So understanding that and knowing that, you know, also puts things into perspective. You know, again, from an extractable standpoint, this is where, you know, again, we've, we've set the foundation of doing an extraction test to give us that base, baseline and benchmark to do a leachable study. You know, and ultimately it's looking at, oops, sorry about the animation that's in there, but, um, you know, again, we did the controlled extraction study, uh, and, and it's really then taking that and how does that apply to the leachables. And so that's really what we've done is to be able to, to further along the studies and be able to look at the, the molecule and the container and how they operate together. So now we'll get into the heart of it. And, and ultimately, this is where we looked and, and we've taken a monoclonal antibody and really decided to, to dissect that and, and look at it in, in full detail. Now, from our standpoint, we know that the technology can work for biologics. I mean, we've been producing a biologic at the site, and we've been commercially supplying it to the market space for over 20 years. So we know that, that molecules can handle it, and we know that the, the, the process can work. But ultimately, what we wanted to do is to be able to take a look at a monoclonal antibody in this approach and, and, and understand, does the heat itself impact any negativity onto the protein? So looking at it at T0, and then what does the stability look like over time? And how does that compare to glass? And that was kind of the design that we had from an experiment standpoint. So what we did was we produced the product out of our Madison facility uh, that does API manufacturing. We brought it in, and then we worked very closely with our analytical department, uh, both in Kansas City and, and uh, Research Triangle Park. And we looked at both of those, and we, we laid out what a program would look like. What are the tests that we need to look at? across these molecules to say, does this work? And so we've worked closely with them and we've started to go through. So this, this I know is you know, an, an eyesore um, you know, from a presentation standpoint, but it really is just to look and say, here are all of the different tests that we've gone through to analyze the, the, the molecule itself. And again, we did these at, at time zero. Uh, the data that I'm showing now is at nine months. Our intention is to run it out over two years. So we're, we're continuing to build this data out. But ultimately, what we showed at time zero, um, you know, is the fact that across those 16 different tests, we filled the product in Advocept. So we, we went through and we put it into the vial uh, in the container closure itself. And we took that and we compared it to the bulk substance. So now here is, a, you know, unprocessed material versus what we've gone through the process. You know, and at the end of the day, we got comparable results across all 16 of those different tests. So at that period of time, we've, we've kind of put to bed, you know, the, the fact that the technology will work and not uh, embark any negativity onto this uh, specific protein. We then took that to the next step. So what we did is we, we filled both, uh, we, we filled that bulk substance into glass and into a glass vial. And then we put bows up on stability and now we've been running through the results. And so now is really where we start to see it. One of the, one of the big things that we added um, from the, the time zero test was actually activity, looking at the potency, what does it look like, marry these two products out and, and, and ran the assay just to look at both. You know, and so ultimately what we've seen you know, within this is that the performance of the molecule itself has really no difference between the Advocep container and the glass container. We then looked at other uh, different types of results. So again, we went through all of these. Um, you know, and we went through the, the you know, SEC results. You know, and again, what we are showing is that you know, ultimately we're getting comparable results between glass and Advocep as we move through. So we've done things even to this point where we did the peptide mapping. One of the things that we did see within this right, is we did see an oxidation difference. So, you know, again, all of the indicators are still pointing, but we did see oxidation difference. And actually there's a higher, um, uh, the, the, the percent oxidation 
is higher than in glass than we saw in Advocept. So it's one of those areas that we need to, one, continue to do research on, right, and knowing and understanding why that a, a phenomenon has occurred. We have our, you know, inclinings, but, you know, is this just a blip? Do we have to do it? So we have, we have plans to, you know, expand out and do, you know, additional monoclonal antibodies, see if it's something that's trending, also looking at this over time to see if there's any differences. But that is something that we notice that is, you know, a difference. But when you look at the aggregate of information, you really are showing comparable results between class and adversary. You know, again, these are all of the other different methods that we looked at, all of the other tests, you know, from, you know, again, simple things like appearance to pH, you know, to the, uh, SD, uh, to the SEC, the HPLC evaluations. And we really are, from that standpoint, across the board looking at it and saying they, they, these molecules are comparable from glass to, to Advocent. And then finally, just show in leachable results. So one of the things is, is that we're definitely going to have different peaks than glass, and, and we show it here. You know, but again, it's under the, the, you know, the threshold levels that are out there. They're still very low in overall extractants. Um, you know, and that's what we saw over time. We will get different peaks. You will have it, but at least from an understanding and a characterizing of the material, that's what we've been driving toward. So again, I, I think I've repeated this one in, in throughout. Uh, you know, from our standpoint and our look, we really do see um, very comparable results across the board between the glass vial and the Advocept vial. And, and from that standpoint, the affinity was there. Leachables data does show different, but from a, a quantitative standpoint, it, it's, it's comparable to what we see in glass. And that's why when you look at the advantages that we've seen from the advanced aseptic processing, you couple that in with the uh, container closure uh, performance, we really truly believe that there is an area for a next generation you know, glass-free injectable platform. So thank you. That's, I, I do want to just compliment and acknowledge my colleagues you know, across the different sites of, within Catalan uh, that have helped support and generate you know, not only the test itself, but also the results that is that associated with that. So at, at this time, I'd, I'd love to take any questions. Have you, com have you filled a commercial product in, in this blow fill seal uh, system yet? Yeah, so from, from the standpoint, so the technology itself, and, and we've been, you know, producing commercial products uh, for over 30 years out at the uh, site. I'm sorry, commercial large, large molecule. Yes. So for over 20 years, it's been approved. So 1993 was actually approved, and it's been out into the market space, you know, since that period of time. So it's a commercial, large-scale molecule. So from a regulatory perspective, do, do, uh, do customers or do, do, they, do they run stability tests, you know, hold a stability sample for the product based on something that had seen the 40 or 50 degrees C for that point of time? Yeah, so they, you know, just to repeat, if I'm, I'm getting it right, so the stability, you're asking, that, do people run stability samples? Absolutely. And we've done some things of, um, we can do some really small uh, feasibility batches with, with down to as low as one liter of material just to run it through so people can see that heat effect, what happens, how do we do it, and then we do absolutely put it up on stability. You still got to go through the same you know, evaluation of any container closure that you would with this. So you do stability, you do leachable programs, and we've, we've tried to benchmark that and, and standardize what it would take to make a conversion from glass into these types of designs. Okay. Uh, last question is on, uh, on the, your uh, resin supply. Do, do you have to prove pyro pyrogen-free somehow in, in that? So, so there's a couple things that we've done. So you're asking if we have proved bio-burden-free? Pyrogen-free. Uh, Pyrogen-free. Yeah. Uh, we've done a couple of different studies and evaluations, um, you know, on the, the incoming materials. So, again, we've, we have been, you know, producing products into the market for a long period of time. So we've set some of that precedent there. We've done a lot of things in uh, the evaluation. So when we, we talked about all of the money that was spent from microbial contamination and control uh, of the system, we did a big study on the... Uh, um, extruder uh, profiles, both looking at endotoxin as well as uh, microbial contamination, what's the reduction over time. And we have, we have determined what it, 
we have determined specifications and driven to raw material incoming specs that have allowed us to, you know, operate, um, you know, in a, in a sterile environment. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the container design flexibility? Uh, the vials and ampules are great, but uh, are you guys uh, uh, seeing any success when it comes to uh, uh, pre-filled syringes or uh, auto-injector uh, type of designs when it comes to blow-fill seal? So design and container design flexibility is one of the main advantages that you have with this technology because you don't have to stay within the same realms of you know, a, a cylinder design. Right, we can do a lot of things very differently and uniquely. Um, you, you can make flat products. You can make them with multiple ports. The specific pre-filled syringe, you know, part of it, it really drives at, um, at 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 how do you insert that plunger either before or after. Um, we have we have focused at least these on products that are in the market. Um, you know, from a, a just a straight container standpoint. There, we're getting a lot of interest in the design element. What else can you do, right? And so pre-filled syringe is a way of looking at it. We're looking at different things and, and different types of designs with customers and by our own of, of how do you make those things fit better, right? But we, you know, specifically, we don't have a pre-filled syringe today in this container and design. It, it, it can be done, though. So there are manufacturers that have you know, looked at it, tried it, um, you know, and, and it's it's the area to me where I think there's so much of a crossover and convergence uh, in the market space now with, with device being so much a part of the drug development life cycle that it's getting looked at. And that's where I think this really will start to open up the window because we can do the, the technology itself provides you the aseptic nature and we're able to efficiently produce it. So now, instead of it just being a pre-filled syringe, if you wanted it to be more integrated into the device itself, either an infusion pump or, you know, different ways, we can make things that are, you know, flat. And, and we can do things with multiple ports. We can do things to change that dynamic. And that's where I think the technology will ultimately go. From a uh, from container and, uh, integrity perspective, how low can you, what's the lowest temperature this stuff can see? So that's a so the question is uh, from a container closure integrity standpoint, what's the lowest temperature that we've we've ran? Is that so? You know, ultimately, polyolefins, you know, in general, operate fairly well in, in cold conditions. So you you see a lot of lyophilization trays, different things made out of polypropylene. You know, even to that extent, you know, a lot of the low density polyethylenes, you know, can go extremely low. Um, from what we have data to speak about. I've got minus 20 data, right? And we've done, you know, the freeze thaw at minus 20. The product's performed very well. We've got, you know, activities in the works to actually look at it at minus 80. We haven't gone lower than that from a cryogenic standpoint, but we're, we're starting the evaluations at minus 80 right now from a, a temperature standpoint. Okay. Well, one suggestion would be maybe looking around the, the minus 40, because if it has a stopper, the stopper manufacturer is not going to claim anything lower than... You know, minus 40, minus 50. So, so that's where I think that the technology itself has some really significant potential. So from our standpoint, the, the stopper is completely enclosed and encapsulated. So from that look, right, we, the, the, the TG of the rubber isn't going to affect the sterility or, you know, penetration on the inside because it's completely encapsulated. And so from there, that's, I mean, that's really why we're looking at a lot of the minus 80 because there is that... That gap, you know, at, at the minus 40 where there's some CCIT questions in current glass files, but because the stopper is encapsulated, the fact that it becomes brittle doesn't, doesn't really affect, it shouldn't. And, and I, I don't want to say I, we need test data to prove, but in theory, thinking about it is a completely encapsulated product. And one last question. So you said during the filling process, the, the liquid that's filled inside it sees a, the maximum of about 40 C. Is, is that the claim? Is that valid? Is that something that you can prove that it doesn't, it will never go above 40 C? So that is, that is where it becomes difficult, right? Because it is a dynamic environment. Um, you know, so, so it is something that we would have to look at and validate. 
But again, we'd have to also see what molecules are out there, that specific molecule, how that operates, does it show anything. You know, we see it at minus 40. I know that the other equipment manufacturers out there have shown it and, and have really solid data showing it at about 25 degrees C. So again, it's how do you get the thermal couple and the inside of that to be able to measure that dynamic nature? You know, and ultimately it has a lot to do with the container design of what that fluid's going to see. So that surface to volume ratio is a huge indicator. So we, you know, a lot of what we've done is tried to force it, do it at a half ml fills and, and really force real, you know, high levels of surface to volume to make sure that it's seeing the most heat that it possibly can. You know, so, so that's, we still have to get a better method of getting in there and how do you actually test it to be able to say that it's validated. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. Appreciate it.